Okay, let's start with some uh, reminders. Uh, first of all, um, office hours are on Wednesdays um, at noon in uh, the large conference room in uh, MEB. And uh, your first homework uh, is due this Thursday, as I'm sure you are well aware of, because I see those little icons on the Google Doc. Um, I want to remind you that you can also be uh, late twice, up to 48 hours without the penalty, and you don't need to contact me about it. Uh, that said, read in the syllabus again uh, what kind of assignments you can be late for. You can be late for all the homework assignments at most twice, up to 48 hours. Uh, and mostly you cannot be late for the in-person activities that will come uh, after the, the spring break. Um, okay, so how are things going with CHPC? Are we hating it mm -hmm. or... <laughs> It's kind of going, are we getting CUDA errors? If you are getting CUDA memory errors, now you are like legit AI researchers. That's like a rite of passage. Mm -hmm. So congratulations. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll stick around here after the class. So if you need any help with that, I'm happy to go with through your errors with you. Uh, if you can't stay after the class, come to the office hours and we'll kind of work uh, through those errors together. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty positive we'll manage to fix them. Any questions about the homework? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, just for the second part, mm -hmm. would you like us to make like a second file for processing the predictions and labels or just do that in the same file and we'll make the one? Um, yeah, you can keep it in the same file. Um, That'd be easier for me to have everything in, in one place. Uh, but I will likely just check the outputs in your write-up about the error analysis part. So the code for generating that is not super crucial because it's you know very simple anyways. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, let's then move forward. So last time we stopped with the pre-training and fine-tuning of language models. We have learned what the transformer is, and we have learned how to fit data to transformer. Uh, now we are going to talk about how these models are pre-trained. Uh, remember, pre-training is this large phase that occurs before actual training, but training with labels, which is you know standard supervised machine learning you all know very well. And it's uh, typically done in, with, um, through a long period of time, um, all these days very likely some kind of corporation or a, you know startup like an OpenAI or Anthropic are training these, and um, all of us are taking that pre-trained model and then we continue training it further with way less data, which is called fine tuning. So one way of uh, one way of pre-training with textual data is mask language mod modeling, uh, which um, uh, works as follows. So you will get, uh, you will scrape the internet, you have a bunch of uh, text data, and you will take a portion of that uh, data, like one document of certain uh, length, and you are going to randomly decide that you are going to replace 15% of input tokens with a special token we call mask. Uh, then you're going to put this incomplete text like this one, you are going to, of course, tokenize it, produce token IDs and everything we have seen last time, and put it into uh, your transformer, which is now a block of uh, encoders. We, in this version of transformer, we don't have decoder, we just have a block of encoder. Remember, each encoder block is composed of self-attention uh, mechanism together with a few feed forward layers together with a residual connection and layer normalization. Um, if we remember, the uh, this is what I just said, this uh, components of one encoder block. And the important thing here is just to know what is the output of encoder block. Uh, if you remember last time, the output will be a new representation of your input token. So each, uh, each token is represented with a vector, we put it into encoder block, and we just have this series of variations that to change that vector, but eventually you also get the vector of that token, but contextualized with respect to other tokens in the input, given that we have used self-attention mechanism. And because transformer is just a stack of encoder layers, 
At the last encoder block, the output is again, just a new representation, this time contextualized with respect to other tokens in the input of a given token uh, in, the, uh, in the input. So what, that, what does that mean is that um, for each one of these tokens in the input, we are going to get a vector representation, including a representation for our mask tokens. So now we can do what we always like to do, and that's uh, take one of these uh, representations and try to predict uh, predict something here. Here, because we are doing pre-training, so we do not have human labeled data. All we have is actual text, right? So we want to use objective that does not assume that we will uh, label data with human annotators. So a great thing we can do here is to predict what was the original token in the input at this mask position. So we take the hidden representation, the output of the last encoder block for that mask token at a certain position in the input. We are going to, again, as always, multiply it with the matrix, output matrix, which will be size of the dimension of our uh, representation times the number of words in the number of tokens in the vocabulary. And this will result with a vector, which is, again, uh, of the size of the um, number of tokens in the vocabulary. We can do standard things we do when we do classification and machine learning, apply softmax to squash those values into between zero and one. And then we can find where is the maximum value in this vector and say, well, uh, this is the, uh, this is the um, highest probability uh, in this logit vector, meaning that we are going to use uh, the corresponding token at that position as being the one that is originally uh, was in the place of the mass token. And now we can just use the uh, cross entropy loss with the uh, our gold label being the actual word that was at that place uh, in text. Any question about this? I'm, I'm kind of repeating the output, you know, output layer. You should be very comfortable with this by now. This is always the same thing. You have a vector representation of whatever you care about, the thing you want to, you know, kind of classify. Here we are classifying the mask token into the, um, what are the possible token, uh, tokens at that position. You always multiply with the matrix of certain size, get the vector, apply soft max and take the arg max. But that's it. Any any questions? Okay. So remember, we didn't uh, have only one mask tokens. We had um, fifteen percent of them. So uh, we don't have only one of these where we get the loss, cross entropy loss. We have uh, a few of them, and for each one of them, we are going to get the loss. Uh, of our predicted token with respect to what the original token was at, at that place. And all we are going to do is average these losses and get the joint loss and do a gradient descent uh, step, meaning we are going to change the values of our weight matrices in the transformer. And we are going to do this many, many times because we have a lot of unlabeled uh, data. So, that's how mask language, language modeling works. Now that the model is trained like this, you will get the transformer, but now instead of randomly initialized weight, uh, weights, we have these uh, numbers there that are um, found through this procedure. And we can do then fine tuning. Fine tuning for you should be a synonym with just supervised machine learning. You have some uh, label data, and you have your model, and you are training the model. The difference is just that now the model is not anymore randomly initialized, like it has been the case before pre-training became a thing, but rather your weights in your transformers have been computed with this long process uh, of pre-training, namely in this specific case with mask language modeling. What does that you know pre-training does is that it has seen a lot of text. So in, without us saying, hey, capture syntax, hey, capture semantics, 
it just implicitly starts to do so because those properties of language are actually necessary to be able to predict what was the original token at the place of the mask token. And those properties and those features are great for many classification tasks with language. So this is why this, this whole pre-training thing is so powerful because you already find those representations of your text that capture a lot of features that otherwise you would need to define manually. So what do we do now? Let's say Google uh, had pre-trained a model and encoder on transformer with mask language modeling. What do we do now? We will go to Hugging Face, where this model will be surely uploaded. And uh, you know now through the homework, most of you have seen that you are going to do something like load from pre-trained, and then you will give the name of that model. But what happens next? Um, one thing I didn't want to mention, but it's important to know that actually uh, when we use encoder-only models and we, when, we, when we do mask language modeling, it is common to put this special token, namely CLS token and separator token that separates different sentences. And the CLS token uh, at the end, uh, due to self-attention, has a, looked at all the other words in the uh, input sequence. Each one of these token has, but here it is at the beginning. For some reason, we deem it might have uh, more, more significance than the others. So what we are going to do when we fine tune a model, we are going to take the hidden representation of our CLS token. When I say hidden representation, I just mean representation at the deeper layer, uh, or in for us, it's always going to be the output of the uh, encoder, last encoder block. And you're going to do what we have seen just a few slides back. You're going to take some output metrics, get the logic vector of the size of number of classes, uh, do the cross-entropy loss. But now your contrast cross-entropy loss is with the human written label for that text. So if this was a, let's say binary center, excuse me, a binary classification of sentiment, positive and negative, like you have in the class. Uh, not in the class, in the assignment, uh, you will take your representation of the CLS token and multiply it with the output matrix that has the two columns. You will get the logic vector of with two values, apply softmax, take the max value to be the predicted one. So it is rather simple what we do once we have labeled, uh, labeled data, right? That said, you know, well, this it might be new to you. So for me, it seems like because I used this gazillion times since 2018 when it was introduced, uh, maybe maybe you have some questions about this this procedure. Yeah. Is the uh, class token like trained at all during the training? Yeah, it is. So all the instances in the in the pre-trained mask language modeling pre-trained models are typically coming with the CLS token at the beginning. So if you're thinking now is uh is this has this token become special? It has become special. It has when people do certain analysis of the CLS token, they will see that it kind of um uh, for example, if we inspect attention scores from other tokens, we will see that the CLS token for gets a lot of importance for all other tokens in the sequence. That's why when we do fine tuning, we use its representation. Um, that said, you are not, you know, your hands are not tied to CLS token. You can take, for example, take the average vector representation of each tokens uh, we have and say the average representation will be the vector I'm going to classify. You can, um, standard things are also max pooling, for example, from each dimension. Uh, let's say we look at the first dimension in each uh, representation of each token and we pick the one which is uh, the maximum. But you know, CLS, taking CLS representation is the simplest and it works well. So you probably don't need to deviate too much from that. Yep. Uh, is there a reason that CLS only applies to the 
Yeah, let me clarify something. It's not the about it being the first word in the first token in the sequence. Each one of these token representation at the final layer is what we say contextualized, meaning that due to the self-attention, you have mixed representation of all input uh, tokens, representations into the representation of the token you are focusing on. It's just because of CLS being seen with every single instance during the pre-training. That makes it special, yeah. But that said, you can, I don't think you would get a terrible representation of your entire sequence if you completely ignore CLS and average the uh, representations of each, all of the tokens uh, that you have in the input. So there is a lot of flexibility, but again, CLS works, so why not use it, right? Okay, so this is uh, just an illustration of what I said. You get model, uh, you get the vector representation of CLS token at the last layer. This is going to be with BERT, uh, 768 dimensional vector, dense vector, meaning no zeros. And then you are going to do standard uh, logistic regression stuff. Multiply with the matrix, apply softmax, yada, yada. So this is just a little illustration of that, if that helps uh, for you when you come back to these slides. And I am want to here just mention this auto model for sequence classification in Hugging Face. Um, this is something you are using probably in your homework assignments if you are following the notebook. And then um, I think it is a reasonable question of what is, like, what is this? And this is just a class that will, given the name of your model, will call some other class in the transformer code base. And you can kind of find your way to the actual class you're using. So if we do that for this little bird, you'll uh, get somewhere here. It's always you. It's always models and then the model name. So if, for example, you are using Diberta. You can go to models, Diberta, and then modeling Diberta, and you will find something similar. But what I want to show you here is that you are, you know, the the part of these classes. What we need are are here. We have another step of just transformation of the last uh, representation and then linear classifier and here we apply some dropout. So there are slight variations of the logistic regression, but in the end, that's that's all you need. So uh, if I'm sure what exactly your classifier is doing, uh, you can always find the specific class you are looking, you know, you're using for your model and read through the code to get the sense of what exactly is happening in the classification layers. All right, so that was mass language modeling, very important, you know, it uh, kind of uh, was released in 2018 with BERT. It really uh, was significant for this whole uh, super pivotal moment in uh, NLP and now for the broader AI machine learning in terms of pre-training and fine tuning. Um, after BERT, other follow-ups came. Uh, the BERT, Roberta is basically uh, optimized BERT in a sense that Bert came out and then Roberto authors were like, let's just check whether we need all these ingredients in this model. And they found a little bit more, uh, like they did certain ablations and find out you don't need exactly everything what was originally proposed in Bert. So for example, besides mass language modeling, there was another pre-training objective and that's next sentence prediction. And they found that we don't need that. So that's why I don't even mention it, but it's, uh, it's something that was later considered to be unnecessary. And then the Berta is even more optimized uh, BERT-like model. So a lot of evidence points that the Berta version three is a really good encoder model. And if you if you are just working with the classification task, uh, most likely you can do really well with an encoder model if you are going to do fine tuning. Uh, and if you are going to do that, fine tune a model for classification and you are looking for encoder model, the Berta version three is a model to go. It's a, it's of similar size as the previous bert like models, but performs way better. So use that one. And it's a common pitfall to use BERT, although it has been repeatedly shown that it's outperformed by these other versions. And in your hugging face code, it's a literally a line of code to change the model name. So why not use the, the best one? 
Um, it is rather small for what we are considering uh, to be a standard model size in NLP these days, uh, but that doesn't mean that you need gazillion uh, parameters. Something to have in mind though. Okay, uh, any questions about mask language modeling and bird like models? Yeah, does the uh, bird does do quite well at uh, sending a similarity Um, I suspect so. I, I haven't myself worked with the sense of similarity task, but um, yeah, there is something called blue benchmark in NLP and it has been a benchmark people have used, people who were pre-training models to say, this my bet model is better than yours. And some of the sense of similarity tasks are in there. So I suspect if the Berta is working better on blue than others, then probably it's better for, for sense of similarity as well. But you know, I'm giving you kind of a recommendation which will certainly have outliers, you know. Um, don't don't ever like be like, ah, the Berta must be the best for from all and for their models for everything. But if if you need to start with something, it's a great starting point. Yeah. Okay, so other objective is language modeling, where uh, we are going to use uh, transformers that do have decoder components. They can have both encoder decoders or just decoders, but we definitely need decoders. And what we are going to do here, we are going to start with a special token, BOS, which stands for beginning of sequence. You are going to put it into your decoder layers and you are going to predict which word should come next. Let's say the model had predicted Sylvester. We are going to put then the Sylvester next to the uh, BOS and try to predict the next token, which can be Stallone. Then we are going to put Stallone into the input, predict the next one, which here is has, and so on. So at every step, we are predicting the, uh, the next uh, token. So now a lot of things are branded, right? Uh, generative AI. This is basically, it. this is the generative AI. It's just predicting the, uh, the, the next token. I mean, models got way complicated now with uh, different things we add to the pre-training, but the gist of it is that we are always predicting text, even though we are doing classification. So to predict the next token, instead you are going to use whatever is the current representation of your token, whatever, sorry, whatever is your current token, then it's representation, put it into decoder stack and predict the next token, which is again, you just need the matrix of the size, uh, the number of tokens in the vocabulary to get the vector of the size of the number of tokens in the vocabulary. You predict the most likely one as to be your next token. Uh, the objective then, remember when we had mask language modeling and we were just averaging uh, the losses from each mask position, here at every step, we are going to get the logit, which serves as a probability, although it's not, and it's conditioned on what we have seen, what we have decoded so far, because decoder layers have self-attention uh, steps towards uh, predicted tokens as well. Uh, and then you're going to just uh, make a product of those probabilities, and that's going to be your loss. So most likely somewhere you have heard Markov chain and stuff like that. This is uh, this is basically uh, it, because this probability is giving you probability of your entire sequence. Uh, that that's what it is. Uh, if you're going to fine tune. Uh, a model that is uh, trained with this pre-training objective, these days you are going to use this generative setup I mentioned. You are going to literally generate word that corresponds to your label. So if you have positive and negative as your labels, you are going to train your model to generate positive or negative. But unlike with, um, with uh, you know, uh, mass language modeling where you had the output matrix, which was of the size, dimension of your vectors times number of classes. Here, you are still sticking with this output matrix. You, you are not adding any new parameters to your model. There is nothing new uh, in terms of new components that we add, uh, add uh, to the pre-trained uh, model. There is the question, however, of um, 
what what we will do if your model generates multiple tokens for a single uh, label uh, name. So if we had positive, and let's say instead of just generating one token positive, the model generates a PO and then the rest of the uh, rest of the work. Now you need to decide what is going to be your logic, right? Um, and if you're fine tuning, I would say you don't need to worry about this too much because your model will generate words positive or negative. But if you are not fine tuning, and that's something we are going to talk more uh, uh, next in the next lecture, then the model can start using synonyms for positive or negative. Um, and that kind of makes your evaluation a little bit harder because you can think, oh, the model is generating something that's not in my label set, therefore is bad, but it actually might not be uh, bad at all because it's, it's just using different way of saying your labels. Um, let's not go into that. Here, if you are fine tuning, we are going to uh, use as a logic, um, maybe the first tokens logic, or we are going to take the average token logic, we can pull the dimensions uh, across different tokens. So there are different things. There isn't super, I would say, people don't, there isn't consensus of what exactly we should do, but I have seen people using the first tokens logic the most. If you have a very fixed uh, label, label set. Okay, uh, any, any questions about this? All right, so the most prominent models in this family you have most likely heard about. These are GPT family of models. And before, you know, uh, we had nowadays GPT-4, we had GPT-2 and GPT-3, and then open source attempts to replicate these models such as GPT-Neo or J and so on. Um, all of these things have one thing in common, they are decoder only transformers, and they are using as a pre-training objective language modeling. And uh, depending on which uh, version we are looking at, there are different sizes this, that this come uh, from with. Um, now, uh, I don't wanna get too much into this. We are going to talk about this, but GPT models after G original GPT-3 had um, extra things that they add in pre-training together with language modeling. So have in mind that, for example, GPT-4 is not pure language models in the sense that it's not pre-trained only with the language modeling objectives. You know, maybe you've heard something like reinforcement learning from human alignment, that's not language modeling. So there are way more than just language models, which I think is very important to know. So only GPT-2, 3 are, but for a while, People, because uh, you know, OpenAI didn't disclose all these details for a while. People called uh, certain models just pure language models when they are not. So GPT-3 is kind of overloaded term because it refers to this original GPT-3, which is pure language model, but then a bunch of instruct models uh, as well. So be cautious if you see GPT-3. Try to understand what exactly are people referring to. But then uh, finally, there is T5, another very important model. It is encoder decoder transformer. It is pre-trained both with the version of mask language modeling. Uh, I'm saying version because instead of masking a single token, they have masked uh, a sequence of a uh, few tokens. So it's um, they call this objective spam corruption, but it's basically the same as mask language modeling. And they also have this suite of supervised tasks uh, so they during pre-training, they had collected a few dozen of tasks and they use standard supervised objectives for those tasks, but framed in this generative setup. Um, and this is this suite of supervised tasks is something that will be is super important for the latest generation of pre-trained or la large language models. We are going to talk talk about this. So there are better versions of T5 as well. Uh, for a while, it was the largest publicly available large language model. So there has been a ton of research with D5. It's really, uh, really important one. But then, of course, there are so many more. And if you go to this uh, page, you, you can uh, find some of them for sure. All right. So any questions about pre-trained language models?
Okay. I hope the silence is not because of confusion, but because you understand everything very well. Uh, and if that's so, let's let's talk very briefly about pre-training and fine-tuning of vision models. And here, one model is very important. It's called uh, CLIP. I also produced by OpenAI that had uh, made, uh, you know, ChatGPT, GPT-4 and models like that. Uh, the thing that they have introduced here is contrastive pre-training. Contrastive objectives have been, you know, introduced in vision uh, before, uh, but they have used it in a really smart way. So here they have N images and N uh, texts, and uh, only uh, for basically a pair of N images and um, N texts. So instead of just considering their like pairs that they are true, they consider that, okay, this uh, image is not the pair with N minus one texts, right? And instead of just saying to the model, you are a pair, they are also saying to the model, you are not a pair. And that's helpful for the model learning. Specifically how this works, they take images, these N images, they use image encoder. In the original clip paper, they have used two kinds of model, vision transformer, Remember vision transform and take takes image patches as an input and that does exactly the same thing as if those inputs were text. And ResNet, which is a convolutional neural network that has been you know, state of the art before vision transformer had become a thing. Now vision transformer are a thing now. So if you are using clip, you are most likely using it with the vision transformer version. So that's the image encoder and text encoder is another transformer. They start with a randomly initialized one and then change weights during the train. Um, for each image, they are going to get some kind of vector representation. Again, comes out of the last uh, layer from the vision transformer. Um, and for each one of these texts, they are going to get the representation that comes from the last layer of the transformer. And they're going to make that product between those two vectors that they projected to the same dimension, such that actually can do uh, dot product. And they're going to get a single value here, single number, which kind of tells how related this image and this text are. Remember I said we started with N pairs and those pairs will be those corresponding to a diagonal here. Everything else is a score for image and texts that are not related to each other. So what they are going to do here is they're going to kind of think about each one of these rows as a logit vector. And remember what we do with logit vectors, wherever is a max, we say these are the, this is the, this is what we predict to be a pair here. Um, and they know what the true pair is, so they can use cross entropy loss again. And they don't need to just do it row-wise, they can do it column-wise as well. So each column can also be taught as a logit vector. And you can, again, because you know what is the pair in this logit vector, you can use cross entropy loss. Here you are combining a single image with different texts. So you tell model, hey, for this image, this is a good text to be associated with, and these are bad texts to be associated with. And in this column, you have one text and different images. So you can say for this text, this is images that can describe, be associated with those, uh, those text inputs and uh, those that cannot. Um, in terms of the code, this is their pseudo code from the paper. This is it. This is all there is to this whole procedure. And I think there is simplicity of it, of it is what it makes it powerful because if something is simple, you can scale it really well, right? And this is what has happened here uh, with Clip. Um, once once these uh, we have trained the model, what we have done, we have changed the weights of our text encoder and we have changed the weights of our image encoder, which are both transformer models. So when we want to do a prediction, what you can do is turn your class labels into sentences. So for example, plane will be turned into a sentence, a photo of a plane, or a car will be turned into a sentence, a photo of a car. So each one of your labels, you're going to turn into a sentence. 
you are going to put into text them into text encoder, have the, the text representation in terms of hidden vectors. You are going to take your image, also represent it with the within a vector, do the dot products, you get your logic vector and you can predict what is the max. Uh, take the max value as to be a predicted label for your samples. So this is what you do at the inference uh, time. Um, this code for the inference you have very nicely already in the original repository. So if you want to play around with, uh, with you know, making prediction for whatever is your classification task of images, you have a great you know, code to get a really solid baseline already. Uh, you have clip in Hugging Face ecosystem and because we like Hugging Face, this makes us very happy. Um, Hugging Face's pages are very slow to me, so I can't show you that, but if you open it, you might get it faster. And then um, certain things are, released in, uh, from the open AI in terms of clip, but then a lot of things are not. For example, information about which data they have used. So a group of researchers from UDAP and their collaborators had tried to uh, replicate clip and then be very, very transparent about how they went about training it. And they actually managed to do so and produce even larger versions of a clip model, which um, are better in terms of the standard uh, classification benchmarks of images. So this is also a very valuable resource to, to have uh, in mind. Okay, so that's all I want to say about pre-training and fine-tuning of our um, pre-trained models. Um, are there any questions about this? The idea behind going through all of this was that you get a sense of what kind of model you can use if you have um, NLP task, meaning involving text, or a vision task, meaning involving images. So these are things you, you could use. Sorry, was there a hand there? Yeah. Yeah, one question about clip. Um, so can it only, um, like, when it impacts clip, like some template that you're feeding in, like a photo of a object you're labeled and you have to like find templates, it seems like this model. Yeah. yeah, I think you do, I don't know the, what would happen if they, instead of a photo, A, they had used um, just, you know, plane or car or whatever. Um, I don't know whether their performance would be widely different. I suspect there, it's probably better for the model, given that they have ended up proposing uh, that and it could come from the data they've been using. Maybe they have framed everything in the pre-training a photo of. Mm -hmm. I suspect they had some kind of caption captioning data that have used, and then maybe the, a lot of instances started with a photo of. Um, now, do you need to start with a photo of? Probably for zero shot. So meaning just don't fine tune the model, just use it as it is. It might be the case you are better off if you if you use you know that uh, phrasing. If you are fine tuning the model, then you can override this format, and that's the case with uh, with uh, you know if you if you are doing text applications as well, you can deviate from the pre training format as long as you are fine tuning the model. Yeah, but zero shot, it's always good to stick as close to the pre training formats as possible. That's the ideal prompting which we will learn about next next time. Okay, uh, we are going to now talk about uncertainty estimation. Before that, we are going to take just a little bit of a break. I need paper tissues, so um, yeah, I'll come back. Take a few minutes.
Okay. Um, let's let's move on. Um, so yeah, I also want to mention that you know we we talked about a few of important pre-trained language models, a few one important pre-trained vision models. There are way more. You might have heard about Dolly or Flamingo, not that not. I might you know mention them now and then, but for the purposes of this class, what we need is a standard uh, model that people use for classification or generation of classification of text or images and generation of text. And this is what we are going to now try to uh, explain in terms of explaining individual predictions. So this is this artifact that we are uh, going to think about when we think about local explanations in this course. And remember when I gave you the intro to the to this class, I said that we are going to have like one baseline, one control for our produced explanations. So our explanations should be better than this control. And that's confidence of the model in its prediction. Remember, our ultimate goal is that we are building models where domain experts such as journalists or doctors or lawyers can reliably use this technology that we are introducing for them. And that means that they get the prediction of the model and they need to decide whether they should rely on it or they should do this instance themselves. And we said, okay, if, the, if we are getting prediction and there is a high score associated with it, confidence score, we can, the person can see this 0 0.87 confidence scores, meaning there is 87% likelihood that this um, class is actually correct. And that's high enough for me for this uh, task we are doing here. So I'm going to go with the model's prediction and uh, say, uh, yeah, in this case, this person is sick. On the other hand, if the confidence really is really low and there is just 13% 13 chance that this is a correct prediction, person one might say, well, I will actually do this myself. I cannot trust the model in this situation. And then they need to do the task themselves, which might be uh, time consuming, for example. So because confidence scores intuitively already have potential to enable appropriate reliance and better human AI team performance, if we are going to produce some explanations for this purpose, they should be better than confidence scores, which are very simple. It's a single single number. It's very, very, uh, very uh, easy to show and to explain to these people what these uh, things are. Um, however, you know, if the uncertainty quantification and estimation would be so easy, uh, we certainly wouldn't have this course. There wouldn't be no material because people wouldn't produce all these alternatives to it. So um, uncertainty quantification and estimation isn't something that works extremely well and we can just use it off the shelf. It doesn't mean it works terrible either. It's just, you know, in this weird zone where maybe if you show something extra, these things could complement each other. And that's that's the idea behind local explanations. So let, let's let's get into it. For this part, I'm going to use the slides from this tutorial. Uh, there is so much to be said about this topic, about uncertainty in quantification estimation. In whatever time we have left, we certainly won't cover all the aspects of it. I will try to go what is important for uh, the course. That said, if you are interested, this is a really great slide deck. Uh, unfortunately, there is no recording, or at least I couldn't find it. Uh, but it's, it's, it's really good to kind of go through these materials if you are interested. So let's start with uh, uncertainty sources. Why would the model be uncertain anyway? So there were two uh, commonly uh, cited sources. One is the source out of modeling or epistemic uncertainty. And this, this uncertainty arises when our modeling assumptions are wrong. So for example, you might have heard of bag of word model where, uh, you know, instead of how we process the sequence with transformer, where you have this, uh, you know, uh, attention to different uh, words and also you have positional embeddings, which tells you which word comes before the other. Here you are just having vector representation for each token and you average them together and that's it. 
So you have lost the information about the order of a sequence and you also don't model these pairwise interactions. So what will happen is, for example, if you have negation such as not happy, this kind of things can be modeled super well by bag of word models. So the model will be uncertain because by design, it was not designed to handle certain kind of phenomena. You also might lack training data. So you haven't seen enough of certain phenomena to actually be able to perform well, although your model made the right assumptions uh, to begin with. And this type of certainty can be reduced by collecting more data or finding a better model. On the other hand, uh, other type of uncertainty can come from the data itself. So the data uh, uncertainty can be just, uh, we can all disagree about what exactly is the, let's say a label for a given text. Uh, one example is when we are labeling uh, text with the toxic information. If you ever try to collect such a data set and then you measure inter annotator agreement, you will find high disagreement because people simply disagree about what's toxic or not. Uh, and collecting more data or changing the model won't reduce this kind of uncertainty. But this is something to have in mind. If your model is uncertain, this could be two sources of un uncertainty. Now, what are the ways to express uncertainty? Uh, we can have a numerical value. That's what I've been showing you before. So here uh, we have a question, where did Super Bowl 50 take place? The, mo the model out of Santa Clara, California, but confidence and confidence is 0 0.85. If this confidence is well calibrated, and we will define what that is, that would mean that uh, this means that uh, there is 85% chance that this is actually true answer. Uh, we can also provide a confidence interval around the numerical value. So we can, if we ask the model what year was Super Bowl 50, uh, it can say 2016, but the confidence interval is like 2015, 2016. So it kind of gives the range of possible uh, values. Uh, similarly, can get uh, give us a set of candidate answers. So instead of you know showing only the most likely answer, it can give us a set of answer uh, the model deems to be appropriate answer to this question, such as who won Super Bowl, and we have two options here instead of one. And now seeing that the model predicts two possible answers, you are getting a sense of, okay, it's not super sure, but these are the possible outcomes, and I can I can check which one I think is right. And uh, it can also decide if we train it in uh, in this way to abstain from answer. So maybe it simply doesn't know who won Super Bowl 50 and it can say, don't know. Um, this decision to abstain had come, I would say pretty late in the game. I think uh, with the introduction of squad version two data set, which must be like 2018 or later, uh, which is kind of, you know, also strange that we didn't have that to be default, like why the model is forced to say something if it doesn't know what the right answer is. Retrospectively, it seems a little bit strange that we didn't have that all along. Um, these are most some most common ways of expressing uncertainty, uh, but there might uh, be some other ones as well. So how we can go about uh, uh, getting the uncertainty estimates well, maybe uh, you, I suppose you all have thought that we can just use softmax scores as a, as a way to uh, get our confidence uh, values. And this is because often it will say, we will, even instructors who do not know that the softmax is just a function that squashes values to zero and one will still present it as a probability because the values in the logic vector will indeed sum to one. But that doesn't mean that the squash value is saying that the there is a certain chance that's going to be the label. That's never been a property of the softmax, and that's what we are going to talk about next. Uh, but this is something you, you might see very often. Some people will have uh, two classification layers, one to make a prediction and the other one to say uh, what the confidence is. There might be like a separate uh, model that evaluates what the confidence is. Uh, we might take Bayesian uh, perspective and take multiple uh, model variations and then sample predictions and then 
uh, have the their variance across these predictions as the be uh, as as a confidence. And you can go re and be really creative. There is really no no rule of what the confidence uh, should be. So some people will take the average uh, nearest neighbor distance from the training data from their given instance. So you have your instance, you have some representation of it, let's say from the last encoder layer, and then you encoded all of your training data. And then uh, you see, well, is this instance now somewhere super, super far away? You can have consistency over labor preserving augmentations. So uh, here we have three different ways of asking the same question. So now we have the model mispredicts one of them. We can say, well, it is not super confident, perfectly confident about this prediction. And um, and um, the last one is uh, checking whether intermediate layers, so you can think about, let's say, each encoder block, uh, although they, ne they don't necessarily use that, uh, you can check whether the each encoder block uh, makes the similar uh, prediction as, as the, uh, let's say, uh, last layer. So what I want to show you with this is that there are many, many different ways you can go about this, and people really uh, do do that. But this one with the um, softmax, this one has been the kind of the most studied one, um, together with the Bayesian uh, modeling. But uh, with neural networks and the uh, way people train them these days, uh, Bayesian perspective is not the dominant perspective of uh, how we go about thinking and training neural networks. And for a lot of people who are, you know, recently trained, they might not even, you know, be fully engaging with these approaches. So softmax is always something that's easier kind of to interact, uh, interact with. Also, there is a, if you're having a neural network, it has a lot of parameters. So having multiple versions of it is not as simple as if you are working with the Gaussian processes where which is a prototypical model for Bayesian approach. Um, so there is there is also also that as a reason for why softmax approaches are more common when, as a confidence measure with neural networks. So we are going to now talk a little bit more about this. Um, we are going to talk about um, probability calibration. And first of all, we are going to define what does it mean that the model is calibrated. So what we would like uh, to be able to do is take the output of our softmax. Remember, that's just a vector of the size of the number of labels we have with binary classification that would be two, only two values in this vector. And we want these values in this vector after softmax to tell us uh, that this is the uh, this is the probability that this uh, is a correct uh, label. So if we get 0 0.9 and 0 0.1 in binary classification setup, we want to say, Okay, uh, if the uh, the first class is uh, is more likely, therefore we predict the first class. Let's say it's a positive class, and it's uh, there is a ninety percent chance that this is uh, uh, the right answer. So you are kind of that that's good. That means that the the there is little chance that uh, it's not good. So we want that property. We want that when we get this, uh, we want that the probability that the model is correct if confidence is alpha, sorry, there is a bracket here missing, I'll fix that, equals to alpha. And this is not the case with your softmax as you, as you know it right now, without any additional tweaks to it. So it doesn't have this property, although people are going to use it as if it has this uh, property. Another way of saying that uh, a model is calibrated is that alpha fraction of all prediction with confidence alpha should be correct. So let me just show you a, a, a little illustration of this. So this blog post goes into that and I recommend them checking it out. And here um, we see that the fraction, so for a given prediction value score, so this is the, let's say 0 0.2, this is the 
the score you get uh, for the uh, from the softmax. This is the fraction of the of the uh, instances with that score that are predicted correctly, where they should be more to the closer to the um, to the black line. So this all of these blue bins should be exactly where the black line is. So this tells us that this property here is not really fulfilled for this model for that was trained for that task. You will see different versions of this, how the people should kind of plot whatever is the score versus whatever is the fraction of instances with that scores that are correctly predicted. Uh, and you will very often see identical function to kind of show that they are not exactly the same things, which is not what we want. Uh, and all I want you to remember here is to think about these things as, uh, okay, the model is calibrated, meaning that uh, in this case of, um, where is it? Yeah, I'll just open it again. Here, it would be exactly where this black line is. Uh, then we have under confident, where less uh, less um, instances with that score are predicted to be correct than they they were, and uh, and over confident. So these are the things that that happen with uh, with uh, neural networks. They are very, very overconfident. They will give you incorrect prediction, but they will give you a very high score for that incorrect prediction. Whereas you expect, okay, if the model is giving incorrect prediction, it should be uncertain about this prediction and therefore it should give me a lower score. Um, another example of this uh, we can see here. So um, this is a, Eminist is a is a very very pop you know famous benchmark that has been around many years back when our models weren't so good and the task was very simple to classify digits. At some point of time, machine learning couldn't do that, and that was a very relevant benchmark to improve our models. Um, now, if you give to this model that was trained on these digits and digit classification a photo that's not a digit. Uh, and because we didn't didn't train the models to abstain from the answer, it will just try to predict a digit, you know, because that's all it uh, knows to do. So this is what's happening with this uh, with these images. But I what I want you to focus on is what is the confidence here. So if you look at the DRS, it says it's uh, digit eight with hundred percent of confidence. Or if we look at this sweater. It's again, digit eight with almost 100% confidence and similarly uh, for these uh, other images too. So this is the problem with neural networks. They are not calibrated well, meaning that for their wrong predictions, they are going to give us very high confidence. Whereas when we read this confidence, we want to read this uh, in a way that says there is 100% chance that these pants are digit eight, which doesn't make sense, right? So kind of to go over what we are talking about here is we are thinking about reliance. We want people to appropriately rely, rely on models. We are deeming, okay, let's show them confidence. And in this way, they can get, a, get some information about whether the model is correct or not. We say, well, you know, there is this softmax layer, soft max layer and softmax. It kind of gives us value between, between zero and one. And sometimes we talk about the probabilities. Is that it? Do we just show the softmax scores? And what we have learned now is that no, we cannot just show softmax scores because they are not calibrated. The softmax value doesn't tell that that's the probability of that prediction being that uh, correct with that rate. So what we're gonna do is to is to make that better. To make that better, where we are using to calibrate now our neural network, we need a measurement as well of how how uh, miscalibrated it is. And there is something uh, we can do here. We can take okay our uh, observed frequency, observed accuracy that the model is correct for the instances with the confidence alpha and we can deduct it from the confidence level. This, this just comes from the uh, definition here. So what we have done is basically 
put the uh, alpha on the other side, and then we can measure how different these things are, where the difference should be ideally be zero, right? So we just made the metric out of it. Metric, I'm not sure it's mathematically metric, but whatever, measurement. Um, because alphas are confidence values and these are continuous values, we don't really want to do this for every single confidence values. And we, we might not have enough instances for different confidence uh, values alpha. Yeah, please go. Will this be on the validate? Yeah, you will do it on a held out calibration set or on a validation set. I'll come to this in a couple of slides because basically what we are going to do, we are going to train the network. Then we are going to have a little held out test for calibration, meaning changing softmax scores such that they have almost zero of this, uh, of, of this kind of the calibration error. And then we have, uh, we are going to do calibration of the, on the, on the validation set and use a whole other set to then test again what the what the calibration error is. So you do need to have multiple splits of your data. That's super important. Um, and there are papers that show how how um, if you're having enough of similar instances, your model might be well calibrated. But as soon as you have out of domain data, then this error is growing, and that's kind of the the issue with the uncertainty estimation from calibrated softmax, and again, need for something extra to help people with reliance is simply to, they're simply not robust enough, yeah. Okay, so we trained a model on a training set. We have used some kind of held out set for measuring contrastive estimation. But uh, what I was saying is that we are not gonna do calculate exactly this, because this depends on the alpha, which is our confidence uh, level. So you would need to do this for every single confidence level. And because these are continuous values, it's, it gets a little bit tricky, right? So instead, we are going to do a uh, bin. We are going to bin our, um, our uncertainty uh, values into ranges from, let's say, 0 to 0 0.2, to, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 to 0 0.4, and so on. So I wanted to show you something a bit later, but now I want to show it right away. And this is a, I want to show you how this binning can uh, look like. Okay. Do we see this? I think it's good. Okay, so uh, this is a very nice kind of um, blog post uh, about our model prediction probabilities. It grounds is this whole discussion in the forecasting, predicting whether it's going to be sunny or uh, rainy. Uh, and then it says, okay, you can do thresholding to decide, you know, you get certain value out of softmax and based on whatever value you can, you don't need to this take the max to be the predicted one. You can say it's going to be sunny if um, if the softmax value uh, passes certain threshold. You can do that. And then depending on what kind of threshold you choose, you can get different accuracies. So here, if we play around with this, we'll see how many things we are getting are mispredicted. If we are having this very high threshold for the softmax, we are mispredicting uh, most of the things. And same when we have very low lab value and somewhere here, we get uh, something that's, uh, that's um, given us the highest accuracy, but it's not necessarily 0 0.5. And now they go into the calibration, which is the thing we are talking about. And here, this is this binning that I was uh, describing. So. What are, you are going to do is you are going to um, bin the possible values for your uh, confidence scores. Possible values grow from zero to one. And here you decided I'm going to have five equally sized bins. So you are going to bin your uh, scores into bins zero to 0 0.2. 0 0.2 to 0 0.4, 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, excuse me, 0 0.8, 0 0.8 to, to 1. And you are going to calculate the error for each one of these bins and average them uh, together. So 
this is what this equation is doing. So we have, first of all, we define the number of bins. In that illustration, we had five of them. Um, and then whatever is our number of example, we have divided, we, we will have certain number uh, of example in each bin. Here it is assume, uh, it's, a, it's not assumed they are equally sized, in meaning that I have e equal number of examples. So uh, this number is how many examples we have in that bin divided by the number of all examples. And then we are going to do something we have done kind of for each individual uh, level before. So we are going to have accuracy of all of the instances in a bin. Uh, and we are going to subtract the average confidence in this bin. And together, this is going to give us a metric, which is called expected calibration error. And luckily for us, uh, someone had made a hug and face space where you can actually just use this metric as it is. So I want to be clear with something here, which might be confusing. Expected calibration error gives us a number to tell us how calibrated our entire net neural network is. It doesn't give us uh, individual confidences on an instance level. It just tells us this is this is uh, how calibrated your network is. And if you see um, a high error here, which is, you know, again, a little bit hard it's, is to say what exactly is high or low, but there are some other people or prior work that have worked on the same task. So you can, you know, usually consult with those prior work to, to see what is the high uh, expected calibration error. If you deem there is high expected calibration error, then you're like, I cannot use softmax as it is for my predictions because my network is not calibrated and my softmax doesn't have the intuition I wanted to have that is that it's probability of my predicted class being uh, correct with that whatever number I am telling you this. And then you need to change it to become calibrated, which we are going to talk about next. But I suspect this is a lot. I, I, you probably haven't seen stuff like this before in the standard machine learning courses. So let's maybe stop and see, um, are we understanding what I'm talking about here? Yeah. Um, so what's, what's the one in that equation? I'm just thinking you're like, I don't have all the things in the right? Like, the side of the bed. Sorry, can you repeat uh, the, I didn't hear uh, the, the term you used. Um, what's the one in the brackets? Oh, this one? Yeah. This one? Oh, this is just a way to write accuracy. So here you will get one only if your predicted label is the same as the gold label and zero otherwise. So summing, you will sum all the ones where you met correct prediction divided by the number of instances in your bin. So this is just an accuracy. And this C is the, the output probability of the model? This C uh, hat is the confidence that uh, right now we are, we are taking the softmax uh, value for your predicted label to be C here. Yeah, so if we had binary classification and we had Two, uh, two values, 0 0.9 and 0 0.1, then uh, we would say first one is predicted with a confidence of 0 0.9. And that would be the C value for that instance here. And then this, this equation is it added up over all the labels? Add to all the labels? Uh, so it's not the label dependent, right? Because um, it, it's instance dependent, right? So here we have, uh, maybe I can go back to that illustration. Not, not, maybe it will be more helpful to look at those. So here we have different bins, right? And um, in this bin, the first bin, we have one, two, three, four, five. I mean, this is this one is on the verge, but let's say it's it's in this bin. So six, seven instances for that bin. Let's see what does the equation do. Uh, for that being, first of all, we are going to see what is the fraction uh, of the all instances that bin is doing. I don't know how many there are in total. Let's say it's 
There are 21 in total. So we have one third of instances are in this first bin. So in a way, if your bin contains more instances, you are giving it more weight, right? Uh, to, to the instances of that bin. And then the, the next part calculates the accuracy in this bin. Um, let's say all of these are correct, except that this one should be in um, cloud. So we have that six out of seven are correctly predicted. So that's our accuracy in the bin. And then for the next term, sums their confidences and divides them by the size of the bin. So I don't know, let's say that all of them had value uh, 0.6, uh, whatever, 0 0.6 times seven is uh, 4.2 divided by seven would be what we get over here. And that's going to be our error, calibration error. Remember if, if it got lost in translation that the these confidences over here, C, should be giving us probability that something is correct. So by comparing the accuracy with the with the average confidence scores, namely the average softmax scores, we are checking whether these two things are same or not. Yeah. So where are those problems for the formula? So there are going to be uh, if for the sake of this illustration, they can be whatever, but we are talking about softmax scores. So uh, if we had binary classification, the softmax will give us a vector of size two for two classes. And uh, we would predict the one which is um, whatever is the uh, higher value and whatever that label is corresponding to, we would predict that to be the label, right? And we can then say or speculate that the value of in the softmax for that predicted label is our confidence. And what I'm saying, it doesn't necessarily need to be. If it will be, if the model is well calibrated. But if the model is not well calibrated, that number doesn't tell us anything about the likelihood of the predicted label being correct. Yeah. Does this clear it up? It's a little bit confusing. So, I... would it be possible to do something other than softmax, like the primary other problems level, and then use this metric? Yeah, for sure. So, this metric is not just about the softmax. So, here you can use whatever confidence scores um, you are using to say that this confidence scores means the probability of my predicted label being correct. Then, could you sort of like test different confidence scores and see what yeah. the matter does? Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Okay, I kind of, because I sense a little bit of confusion, I will just go through what we have talked about here real quick. We are grounding everything in reliance. Our confidence scores are a way to signal to a person the probability that the predicted label is correct. If the probability is really high, there is a good reason for them to use that. If the probability is very low, there is a good reason for them to not use the uh, prediction. We are saying that these are very simple signals for a person to, you know, um, encourage their appropriate reliance. Therefore, this is going to always be our control if we are introducing explainability method for the sake of reliance. It's our baseline. We must be better than this. Okay, and maybe we are better only if we show both confidence scores and uh, explainability methods. So, um, but, we we must bring something that's that's uh, building on top of this. Then we talked about why the model can could be uncertain and how we could present uncertainty. And I said, well, conf, uh, the the softmax scores are the things that people nearly really say are confidence scores. And so we could think be thinking, oh, we just use softmax score for the predicted label as this confidence. Um, and then now we have seeing that no, we cannot because these uh, models are not calibrated well, which means that the, this number we are getting from the softmax for our predicted label is not the probability that uh, this uh, label will be correct. 
if that was the case, then the model would be well calibrated and then we could use softness. We have seen examples where the model makes wrong prediction, but it's super, gives us confidence of 100% showing uh, this phenomena where a model is not calibrated well and it's confidently incorrect. So if you were showing that confidence to a person trying to appropriately rely on this model, that would be totally misled. And now we said, okay, we need a measurement of how miscalibrated our models are because uh, we want to be able to say they are not calibrated, therefore we must, must do something extra. And if we do that, do that something extra, we can still check whether indeed our confidence scores are what we need them to be. We said there is this confidence uh, uh, calibration uh, error we could use, but it depends on the um uh, on the confidence level which is um you know from zero to one we have infinitely many of them so it's kind of weird to try to calculate this for every single confidence level instead we, we are going to do binning where we bin uh bin uh scores in in similar ranges from zero to 0 0.2 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 and so on depending on what this what the number of bins uh is and then for each one of these bins we are going to calculate something which approximates this um, calibration error and then average the approximate uh, uh, calibration error of each bin. And to do that, this inside term is the most important one. We take all the instances on our bin, meaning let's say all the instances that have um, softmax value for their predicted label, to be between let's say zero and 0.2, we check the accuracy of those instances and subtract the average confidence, the average softmax value for the predicted label in that bin. And that approximates our calibration error. And in this way, through these multiple bins, we have calculated expected calibration error. If this error is high and we have used whatever we have used here for our uh, confidence scores and keep saying softmax because that's what we care about right now, and then we can say, we can just not use the softmax scores as they are, we need to tweak them to make this error smaller. And that's what we are going to talk about next. We are talk, going to talk about how to tweak softmax in a very simple way to reduce this, uh, this error. And then this, if the error we are achieving is very low, then we could start using those calibrated confidence scores in our uh, measurement of appropriate reliance. Okay, we are done, but we can talk more. Anyway.